Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Sanders Foundation and Rutgers University and all involved for this opportunity to speak to you this afternoon about a significant topic in the philosophy of religion, namely uh, pantheism. Not, as Paul Benasser suggested to me the other day from the poster, it's a beautiful poster, I, I love it, pan the ism, though I, I, I will do a little panning uh, of uh, the use of ism words in philosophy. Uh, pantheism is a topic that has a claim on the attention of anyone who wishes to take the history of religions uh, comprehensively into account in thinking about religion. There are important pantheist strands in a number of religious traditions, most famously perhaps in non-dualist Advaita uh, Vedanta in Hinduism. And more or less pantheist views can be found in the work of major philosophers in several times and places. In the Western cultural sphere, Pantheism has long been regarded as religiously heterodox, at times indeed as scandalously heterodox. But from the mid-18th to the mid-20th century, forms of pantheism were viewed very favorably by metaphysical idealists who were highly influential in professional philosophy and by romantic movements whose cultural impact was much wider. Pantheism has been a much less favored topic, however, for dominant philosophical and cultural movements in the last half century. And a large proportion of the few philosophers who still write about it do so in the idioms of an absolute idealism or a process philosophy that most of the rest of us find not only dated but rather opaque. Pantheism is too important a topic, however, and too permanent a possibility for religious thought and feeling to be treated as simply out of date. I wish, therefore, to speak about it this afternoon in historical perspective, but also in the idiom or manner of the analytical mainstream of Anglophone philosophy. Three questions mainly will concern me. First, uh, what is pantheism, or what might it be? Second, and this will occupy the longest part of the paper, do traditional theistic beliefs have metaphysical implications that fit some form of pantheism? Third, if such implications were accepted, how would it be reasonable to characterize the relation between God and world? So, first part, what is pantheism or what might it be? Though substantially pantheist views have a much longer history, the word pantheism and its cognates did not appear in English and other languages until shortly before or after 1700. The Socinian writer John Tolland is generally uh, uh, credited with being uh, the first to use the terminology in English, at least perhaps the first to use it at all. There's no single precise answer to the question, I think, what the word pantheism means. There is a fairly wide range of doctrines that have been used to dis that have been described as pantheist by many or most of those who think about them. That is far from unusual for English words ending in ism or ist. Such words typically carry a real danger of thinking we know what we mean by them when in fact we have only the vaguest idea what we are talking about. Still, it can be difficult to discuss intellectual and cultural history without making some use of them, and there are ways to use them without obfuscation. One way is to give a clear and reasonably sharp definition of the word in question and use it only in the sense defined. I will not follow that path today. I will not give you a precise definition of pantheism, as I would like us to approach with a fairly open mind the question what pantheism might be. Instead, I will begin with an open-ended characterization of two historic paths to pantheism, which I will quote from a classic reference work. I will then narrow my focus to one of those two paths. In discussing it, I will formulate doctrines as precisely as I can, and I will refer to them as precisely as I can in ways that do not presuppose that any of them is to be identified with pantheism. <clears throat> 
I am not, however, renouncing the possibility of discussing the suitability of classifying one or another doctrine as pantheist. The reference work with which I begin is Hastings' Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, uh, a rather old reference work. Uh, its article on pantheism by A. E. Garvey states that pantheism, according to the etymology, is the view that all is God and that God is all. But since thought can move either from God to all or from all to God, it can assume two forms. If it begins with the religious belief or the philosophical faith in God as infinite and eternal reality, then the finite and temporal world is swallowed up in God. Garvey says that this first type of pantheism, moving from God to all, is theistic, but that the second type, moving from all to God, is atheistic, for it begins with the scientific conception or the poetic vision of the world as unity, and then God is lost in the world. Garvey's uh, use of the labels theistic and atheistic here might be questioned, but I think he is profoundly right in distinguishing pantheism that begins from views about God and includes everything there is in God from pantheism that begins from views about the world and says, all of this is God. Of these two approaches to pantheism, I will focus on the first, the one that moves from God to all. Of the two, it is much more strongly connected with philosophical theology in the Western tradition and in Anglophone philosophy today. But the other approach deserves a bit more comment before I turn away from it to the alternative on which I wish to focus. It is sometimes said that pantheism entails a denial of the personality of God. That does not seem to me to follow if one starts with beliefs about God and then includes in God the world that we experience. That procedure seems perfectly consistent with supposing that there is in God, and hence in the all, both an omniscient consciousness and uh, world-shaping purposive action. And broadly, pantheist views that exemplify the first approach uh, tend, though not without exception, to include those features. That can be viewed as supporting Garvey's classification of such pantheism as theistic. But if, on the other hand, one begins with the natural world as we experience it and holds that God is nothing less but also nothing more uh, than, the nat than that natural world, one will most likely not uh, ascribe to that God as a whole any omniscient <coughs> consciousness or purposeful action as, at all. And it seems natural to regard such a view as atheistic. Do pantheists who deny that God is anything more than the natural world have any reply to the suggestion that they are really atheists? Perhaps they do. They may say that in referring to the system of nature as a whole as God, uh, they fitly express a reverence and awe and gratitude that it deserves as a thing of wondrous beauty and the source of our life and all that we enjoy. Some of them might add that in heightened awareness of nature, they experience a transcendence of self and of petty self-centered concerns, which they regard as typical of religious mysticism at its best. Strands of naturalistic pantheism and nature mysticism of this sort can certainly be found in the literature of the Romantic movement of the late 18th and early 19th centuries and of present day environmental movements. That said, it is clear that what is called God in this naturalistic understanding is very different from what has ordinarily been meant by God in our culture and its closest ancestors. In the rest of this lecture, I will focus on the opposite way of developing a pantheistic view. It starts with a conception of God or of certain distinctive attributes of God and argues that such a God or a being with those attributes must be understood as including in its own being everything that really exists, including everything that we would call natural. On a pantheistic view of this sort, the divine being will be understood as including all of nature, but also aspects distinctively divine and supernatural, typically including, as I have noted, 
an omniscient consciousness and a will that is omnipotent or at least plays a central role in organizing every aspect of the universe. In such views, it is commonly held that God could have existed without this or that particular finite or natural object, though, though no such objects could have existed without God existing. It may or may not be held that God could have existed with no finite objects at all existing. Holders of such views may hold that though natural objects exist only in God, they are not parts of God if God could exist without them. Whether that is the right thing to say depends on issues about the meaning of part that need not concern us here. Views holding in this way that God includes all of nature, but also more than nature, are now often referred to as panentheist rather than pantheist views. That is largely due to the influence of Charles Hartshorn, the most prominent Anglophone philosophical sponsor of pantheist ideas in the second half of the 20th century, who preferred to call his own view panentheism. The term is supposed to signify that everything is in God, but that nature or the world we experience is not identical with God. Hartshorn's contribution to this subject is really important, but I will not be speaking here of panentheism instead of pantheism or as something distinct from pantheism. It's a dangerously enticing illusion to suppose that multiplying ism words in this way will give us clarity on this topic. The only reliable way to clarity in such matters is to refer constantly to clear and appro appropriately precise, that's not infinitely precise, statements art articulating the views under discussion. So, part two. Do traditional theistic beliefs have pantheistic implications? If we are to avoid vague generalities in discussing this question, we had better begin with a focus on one specific theistic doctrine. My choice is the doctrine of divine omniscience, the doctrine that God knows absolutely everything. That will do for now as a formulation of the doctrine, though we will eventually have to make some decisions as to what is to be covered by the word everything in this context or a certain decision one way or the other about it. I choose this doctrine for two reasons. One is that it is the doctrine that first got me really interested in questions about pantheism. The second is the central place that the doctrine had in the episode that marked the emergence of pantheism as a serious candidate for public discussion in modern Europe, the pantheism controversy of the 1780s in Germany. The story starts before the 1780s. It starts in the 17th century with Spinoza, if not before. His ethics propounds a philosophy that surely qualifies as pantheist, beginning with a conception of God as infinite and utterly independent substance, and arguing from that and other assumptions that God is the only substance and that nothing other than God can exist except in God as a modification of God. He holds that God has infinitely many attributes of which we know only two, thought and extension. Our minds, on his view, are finite modifications or modes of, of God in the attribute of thought and our bodies finite modes of God in the attribute of extension. Despite his occasional use of the phrase Deus sive natura, God that is nature, Spinoza's pantheism can be interpreted, controversially no doubt, as one that is built around a conception of God as more than a sum of ordinary, a sum, more than a sum total of ordinary objects of experience. Spinoza does not regard, regard God as a whole as capable of purposeful action, but his God does have an infinite understanding which is an infinite and eternal mode or modification of God in the attribute of thought. Our minds, in Spinoza's view, are parts or logical fragments of that infinite understanding, though not parts of God's substance, which Spinoza says has no parts. It is not easy to determine how close Spinoza's conception of God's infinite intellect comes to traditional conceptions of divine omniscience, but the structure of his system clearly requires the divine intellect 
to include a great deal of knowledge that no human mind possesses. Spinoza's pantheism includes versions of some other traditional doctrines about God, including God's aseity, or total independence from anything else, and the total dependence of everything else on God. But it is also strongly motivated by modern themes, including Cartesian themes in 17th century philosophy. I will not say more for the moment about the content and motives of Spinoza's system because my main interest in it at this point is in its reception in the 18th century. Spinoza arranged for the system that I have just briefly described to be published only after his death in 1677. A prudent decision, for the work was received with indignation even in his native Holland, one of the most tolerant parts of Europe. For decades afterward, the work had little openly acknowledged influence on European thought. The great German philosopher Leibniz, usually tolerant and generous in relation to other thinkers, never referred, after the publication of Spinoza's system, to Spinoza except to disagree with him, although he had certainly borrowed some important ideas from Spinoza. Spinoza's pantheist views were regularly called atheist. David Hume, for example, referred to him, perhaps not without irony, as that famous atheist. There was, however, an underground interest in Spinoza in the radical wing of the Enlightenment, and by the middle of the 18th century, his work was getting a more sympathetic reading from established icons of the Enlightenment in Germany. And that is the source of the pantheism controversy to which I referred. The controversy, so far as it concerns us here, chiefly involved three authors. Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, famous dramatist, public intellectual, and sharp-witted writer on religious and philosophical topics, a leading light of the German Enlightenment. Friedrich Heinrich Jacobi, a younger but very well-connected public intellectual, intensely interested in religion and philosophy. And Moses Mendelssohn, one of the main religious philosophers of the Enlightenment, particularly in its Jewish form, an acquaintance of Jacobi, as well as a friend and collaborator of Lessing, with whom he had shared an interest in Spinoza as early as the 1750s. The famous controversy began in 1783 when Jacobi sent to Mendelssohn an account of conversations he had had with Lessing in the summer of 1780, less than a year before Lessing's death. Jacobi in interpreted what Lessing said to him as revealing that Lessing had become a thoroughgoing Spinozist. Jacobi's own views and aims were quite complex. On the one hand, he praised Spinoza's work as presenting the conclusions to which rationalist philosophy rigorously pursued must lead. However, he held that those conclusions were religiously and humanly unacceptable. For instance, a denial of free will, which a human mind can scarcely find bearable. The lesson that Jacobi proposed to draw from Spinoza's philosophy, and that Lessing was unwilling to accept, was that rationalist philosophy tries to explain too much and that a limit must therefore be set to such philosophizing. Jacobi believed that anyone who doesn't try to explain what is incomprehensible but wishes only to know the limit beyond which it begins and to recognize that it is there will achieve the greatest scope for genuine human truth within himself. His main reason for engaging Lessing in this discussion had been to seek his help against Spinoza. And in writing to Mendelssohn, he apparently hoped that Mendelssohn's orthodox theism could be enlisted in a campaign against Spinozism, and as Jacobi saw it, against the excesses of Enlightenment rationalism in philosophy, a campaign that might well be damaging to Lessing's reputation. Mendelssohn was offended and alarmed by Jacobi's approach. He resented Jacobi's treatment of Lessing and he very likely agreed with Lessing's reported comment that the limit Jacobi proposed to set to rationalist philosophizing would give unlimited scope to dreams, nonsense, and blindness. In 1785, almost simultaneously, after months of back and forth between them and with mutual recriminations about breaches of confidence all around, Jacobi published his report of his conversations with Lessing and he and Mendelssohn each published their views about the disputed issues. The main effect 
contrary to Jacobi's aims, was to set off an explosion of largely favorable interest in pantheism among the younger generation of German philosophers and intellectuals. I shall say no more here about Jacobi. I have not found him particularly illuminating about pantheism, and I shall refer to Lessing only occasionally, as his contributions to the discussion of pantheism were only fragmentary. There is reason to think he did not wish uh, to be systematically attached to any ism. Jacobi may well have been too humorless to appreciate the extent to which what Lessing said to him manifested his penchant for irony and playing the devil's advocate. The text that interests me most in the pantheism controversy is chapter 14 of Mendelssohn's Morgenstunden, or Lectures on the Existence of God, which he published in 1785. In the previous chapter, Mendelssohn has made clear his own rejection of Spinoza's system as he understood and in part misunderstood it. We needn't worry here about the arguments he deploys against it, for which he credits Christian Wolff, the broadly Leibnizian dominant figure in German philosophy of the second quarter of the 18th century. Uh, those objections, those arguments rest on a misinterpretation of Spinoza as identifying God with, simply with a sum total of finite beings. As chapter 14 opens, indeed, it becomes clear that Mendelssohn himself is not confident that those arguments can sustain a comprehensive rejection of all forms of pantheism. The central topic of four, chapter 14 is uh, what Mendelssohn calls a purified pantheism, of which he affirms not the truth, but the harmlessness. He also makes clear that he does see a case to be made for it, though it is not his own view. The form of the chapter is an imagined dialogue between Lessing and traditional theists. The imagined Lessing begins uh, by conceding that God must not be conceived as a mere sum total of infinitely many contingent beings. The unique necessary being cannot just be ex extensively infinite by including an infinite number of finite beings. It must also be intensively infinite in power, the imagined Lessing says. Then M Mendelssohn has Lessing pose a challenge to the traditional theists focusing on the doctrine of divine omniscience. And here I, I quote at length, and it's on the handout. The theist, must also, <coughs> the theist also must grant to the series of things that have become actual a kind of ideal existence in the divine understanding. And the pantheist can grant this without compromising his system. But he will stop, the pantheist will stop with this ideal existence. And when the theist pushes on, it adds that God has also imparted to this actual series of things an objective existence outside of himself. Then the pantheist discreetly pulls back and sees no reason to grant this. How will you convince him of this objective existence outside of the divine understanding? Who tells us that we ourselves and the world that surrounds us have something more than that ideal existence in the divine understanding? that we are something more than merely God's thoughts and modifications of his primal power. Viewed from this side, the pantheism that you believe you have overthrown seems to me to be standing perfectly on its feet again. Do you want to refute it? If that's to, be ha to happen, it must be shown that the archetypes, Urbilder, outside of God, do not have the same predicates as the representations or images, builder of them, that are to be found in God, in God. But this you yourselves deny according to your system. God's thoughts must indeed be true and fitting in the highest degree and therefore must have all the predicates that belong to their objects. Lessing had in fact certainly thought of this line of argument and had probably shared it with Mendelssohn. In a fragment written in 1763, Lessing says it is an absurdity to suppose there is something in the reality of outside of him of which God has no conception. But if there is nothing of this kind, if in the concept which God has of the reality of a thing, everything is present that is to be found in its reality outside him, 
then the two realities are one and everything which is supposed to exist outside of God exists in God. At this point in the imagined discussion in chapter 14, Mendelssohn interrupts on behalf of traditional theism. There must be, he says, predicates that distinguish the real object or archetype, urbild, from the image built in God's mind that represents it. <clears throat> but what can those predicates be? Mendelssohn offers an interesting answer to this question, focusing on our self-consciousness. In it, as I read him, he does not deny that what has reality in my conscious state is also real in God's knowledge of it. That is not where my conscious state and God's knowledge of it differ. They differ rather in their relation to other things, things which I do not know. In this, I take Mendelssohn to be assuming that divine omniscience has what Linda Zagzebski has been calling recently omnisubjectivity, but by which she means the property of consciously grasping with perfect clarity and ac perfect accuracy and completeness every conscious state of every creature from that creature's first person perspective. So the property of consciously grasping, grasping with perfect accuracy and completeness every conscious state of every creature from that creature's first person perspective. That's Zagzebski's formulation, but I'm assuming that that is roughly what Mendelssohn is assuming is included in contained in divine omniscience as regards our conscious states. This is a, uh, omnisubjectivity is a controversial assumption. Arguably it had no place in philosophical theology before the rise of modern empiricism. And problems have been raised, uh, as you might expect, as to how anything resembling pains and feelings of shame, for example, could be present in God's mind. Nevertheless, it is not hard to think of reasons why it might be religiously desirable and important to ascribe omnisubjectivity to God. God is supposed to know about us everything we know about ourselves and, and, and more, particularly including our present state of mind. The communion service in Anglican churches traditionally begins with a prayer to God unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets can be hid. And a psalmist declares, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me, thou discernest my thoughts from afar. Even before a word is on my tongue, lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Should we not expect, should the religious, the theistic believer at least not want, not expect and want our omniscient creator, governor, and judge to know our conscious states, our joys and sorrows from our point of view, to know what it's like to be us in that way? What then can be the unmistakable marks that in the most infallible way, as Mendelssohn says, distinguish me as an object from myself as a representation in God? What can be the predicates that distinguish our conscious states from the image of them in God's understanding? Here is Mendelssohn's answer. It's also on the handout. The consciousness of myself, combined with total ignorance of everything that does not fall within my circle of thought, is the most eloquent proof of my substantiality outside of God, that is, of my archetypal existence. God has, of course, the most correct, correct conception of the measure of my powers and therefore also of the extent of my consciousness. But in him, this image of my consciousness is not cut off, as it is in me, from the consciousness of his infinity. What is presented here as proving the dif difference and hence the distinctness of my conscious state from God's image of it is that it is limited, cut off from other knowledge in a way that God's knowledge of it is not. As Mendelssohn says, uh, it is one thing to have limits, to be limited, as my conscious state is. It is another thing to know, as God does, the limits that a being distinct from oneself has. In other words, our conscious experience always has the form knowing A and not knowing B not knowing B at all, whereas God's, 
knowing of our conscious experience has the form knowing a case of not knowing A and not knowing B, and also knowing B. For Mendelssohn, this is, I think, the decisive <coughs> proof of the substantiality of finite things outside of God. He does not, however, present his proof as the last word on the subject. That is a mark of his dialogic, dialogical and epistemically humble philosophical temperament. He has his fictitious imaginary Lessing raise, as Lessing probably would have raised, the question, must something further be added to God's thought if it is to become real outside of God? Or alternatively, what does God do additionally to his thoughts so that they also become real outside of him. What's the difference? Responding to the first of these formulations, Mendelssohn says that it gets to the bottom of our controversy. And to the second, he replies, in effect, that God alone understands the answer, and you shouldn't demand such a thing from a poor hypothesis peddler. As regards any finite mind, he says, he has shown that its combination of consciousness and ignorance shows that it is a substance outside of God. That's what he thinks he, he's, he can show as regards any finite mind. Mind. That's enough in his opinion to decide the controversy about pantheism. So he explicitly will not go into the question whether, as Leibniz held, all beings subsist for themselves, for themselves, for sich, only insofar as they have powers of representation, or whether there is also a kind of substantiality that belongs to matter. And with perhaps an echo of Kant's recently published critique of pure reason in mind, Mendelssohn adds that the whole province of reality that we do not ourselves possess is also alien to our cognition and cannot be cognized by us intuitively, unschauend. That is roughly all that I think we will learn from Mendelssohn and Lessing as regards the bearing of omniscience, if it includes omnisubjectivity, on the truth or falsity of pantheism. So what should we say about it? Has Mendelssohn give us, given us a, confusing, a convincing reason for not saying that a doctrine of divine omniscience, including omnisubjectivity, should lead those who hold it to deny that we, and in particular, our conscious states exist outside of God? First of all, Mendelssohn seems clearly right in saying that an omniscient God must know my conscious state as part of a much larger reality than I am aware of, and that there must therefore be some distinction between my consciousness and God's knowledge of it. But surely, just such a distinction can, be can obtain between a whole and a proper part of the whole. Such a distinction indeed is presumably implied when Spinoza says that our minds are parts of the infinite intellect of God. He certainly means the infinite intellect of God knows more than any of its, you know, any one or several indeed of its finite parts. That marks the finite parts as, as something other than God, as Spinoza implies that God's modes are but not, in Spinoza's view, as something existing outside of God. Thus far, I think Mendelssohn's argument is not enough to prove, as he claims, my substantiality outside of God. But I wasn't really looking for a proof of that. More important for our present discussion is the fact that the fit between whole part relationships and the kind of distinction that Mendelssohn is able to show threatens to leave him without an answer to another question, namely, uh, Lessing's, it's really Lessing's question, I think that's clear from, the, from Lessing's remains, the question, what would it consist in? What would it consist in for my consciousness to exist outside of God's omniscient knowledge and not only in it? That seems to be the question in this neighborhood to which Lessing most wanted an answer. I will suggest for our consideration four further answers that might, to the question that might be considered. We can take one of them as suggested by Mendelssohn's statement of his conclusion as my substantiality outside of God. 
he does seem to have conceived of our existing outside of God in terms of our being substances distinct from God, in contrast to Spinoza's doctrine that God is the only substance. That conceptuality is involved also uh, in the terms in which the First Vatican Council, almost a century later, anathematized pantheism as the doctrine that there is one and the same substance or essence of God and of all things. A more or less Aristotelian concept of substance is assumed in these concepts, in these contexts. But by 1785, that concept had been problematized in the development of modern philosophy. Mendelssohn must surely have known, for example, that in the Critique of Pure Reason, first published four years earlier, uh, Kant had argued that we do not know whether our, self is, our own self is a substance or not. Uh, the most relevant case for uh, Mendelssohn's argument, actually. I do not mean to dismiss the traditional conception without argument, but in a modern philosophical context, an account that explains a denial of part-to-whole relationship in terms of distinctness of substances would require a good bit of further unpacking of the concept of substance being used. That line of argument might be interesting, but I will not pursue it here, as I think it is rather unlikely to lead us out of permanently disputed territory. Mendelssohn himself declines, for similar reasons, to pursue a second answer that might be suggested by the question whether there is also a kind of substantiality that belongs to matter. Materiality of a created thing could be taken to explain its being outside of God since God was generally assumed to be essentially immaterial, though Spinoza, as was well known, did not assume that. However, idealist strands in 18th century philosophy, including Leibnizian philosophy, had prob problematized the concept of matter even more than that of substance. Mendelssohn himself was broadly Leibnizian in his outlook. In the present context, uh, he is content to set the problem, problematic topic aside. I'll suggest a third possible response to Lessing's demand for explanation. Mendelssohn does not suggest it, nor would any 18th century writer be likely to have suggested it in the terms that I shall use. Um, Never mind uh, for now, never mind for now uh, whether we finite thinking beings are substances or not. Uh, actually, this is one of the, the responses I would be likely to suggest, uh, to suggest I should say that. So never mind uh, whether finite thinking beings are substances or not. Even if we are not, may it not be that our conscious states or states of affairs that they constitute have identities of their own which make each of them distinct from any other such states, no matter how similar. May they not have, as I would put it, primitive, irreducible, non-qualitative thisnesses of their own. If they do, perhaps that could explain how they could exist outside of God, in addition to perfect duplicates of them existing in God to constitute God's knowledge of them. But irreducible thisnesses are certainly controversial among metaphysicians. They are absolutely contrary, for example, to the Leibnizian thesis of the necessary identity of indiscernibles. Those who wish to commend some form of theism might well prefer to rely on some more popular conceptual apparatus. So I will consider one more explanation, a fourth one, that may be proposed for the separateness and mutual externality of creatures in relation to God. May it be that we creatures have powers and perform actions that are not in God at all. This question certainly connects with religious interests of traditional theists, and many of them will say that we have powers to perform and do perform actions that cannot be in God because they are wrong. Some theists can and will insist on that consistently. But the question is, in fact, a two-edged sword as regards the pantheism issue. For there is a view very strongly represented in theistic traditions that tends to problematize the distinctness of divine and creaturely actions, though most of the partisans of the 
uh, doctrine in question that resist that uh, characterization. It seems to me it does problematize the distinctness. I refer to the doctrine of divine concurrence with the actions of creatures. This doctrine uh, was held by the overwhelming majority of Christian theologians, both Catholic and Protestant, from the Middle Ages until the eve of the 18th century, and still has proponents today. Their view is not only that created things could not begin to exist without God's creative action and could not continue to exist without God's conserving action, causing them to exist, but that no creature could perform any action without God's causality concurring in that action. According to the 17th century Lutheran theologian, Johannes Andreas Kvenstedt, for example, and this is also on the handout, we should observe that God not only gives to second, that is, created causes, the power to act and also conserves it, but that he immediately influences or pours into, influat in is the Latin, the action and the effect of the creature so that one and the same effect is produced not by God alone nor by the creature alone but by God and by the creature at the same time by one and the same total efficacy. Kvenstedt also states, I say that the act, that is God's concurrence, neither precedes nor follows the action of the second cause, but the act is such that it is inwardly included in the action of the creature. Indeed, it is that very action of the creature. Objections to this doctrine may already have occurred to some of you. It may well look problematic to those whose theologies stress human free will understood as, as incompatible with causal determination. But the possible objection that particularly interests me at the, in the present context is one to which Friedrich Schleiermacher calls attention. He quotes this passage from Quenstedt in the first edition of his systematic theology, his Glaubenslehre, published in 1821, and in fact, that's where I borrowed the quotation. Schleiermacher's comment on the passage uh, refers to that in the passage which will give it for many a certain appearance of pantheism. What is it in the passage that will give an appearance of pantheism? Schleiermacher does not say, uh, but he may have been referring to Kvenstedt's statements that the same effect is produced by God and by the creature at the same time, by one and the same efficacy, and that God's act is inwardly included in the action of the creature in such a way as to be that very action of the creature. That can easily be read as implying that the power of the creature is identical with the power of God in this action, and also that God's action and the creature's action are identical, are, are one and the same. Perhaps Kvenstedt was merely careless in writing in a way that left that interpretation open. If not, it's probably one of the more extreme statements of the doctrine of divine concurrence. But even the most careful statement of the doctrine of divine concurrence might seem to threaten or diminish the separateness of God and creatures. For the doctrine is to be understood as asserting a necessary coinciding of divine and creaturely action. Necessarily, a creature acts if and only if God acts too in producing the same effect. How external to God can our actions be if that is true? So then, uh, the third question in the final part of the paper, how then should we characterize the relation between God and world? Schleiermacher belonged to that younger generation of German intellectuals for whom the pantheism controversy threw open new doors for religious thought. Almost 40 years younger than Mendelssohn, he was a significant participant in the early days of the Romantic movement in Berlin in the 1790s. He was deeply influenced by Spinoza in those days. And though he became more cautious with age in his thinking about Spinoza, still in his maturity, unlike, unlike <coughs> Mendelssohn, he was much more influenced by Spinoza than by Leibniz or so I read him anyway. Still, his stance toward pantheism in 1821 was close in important ways uh, to that adopted by Mendelssohn at the end of the 14th chapter of his Morgenstunden. There, after reiterating his support for a theistic rather than a pantheistic doctrine, 
Mendelssohn suggests that the difference between those two views may be mainly a difference between the images expressed by outside and inside and less substantial than it is usually taken to be. Is the controversy between them perhaps about an unfruitful question, as Mendelssohn calls it, uh, whether God has let these thoughts of the best system uh, of contingent things, the Leibnizian best possible world, shine out, flow out, stream out, or with what image shall I compare it? Whether he has let the light flash away from him or only shine inwardly. If one uses such pictorial ways of speaking to make perceptible to oneself the divine bringing forth, creating, and actualizing, it is hard to keep misinterpretation and misunderstanding from stretching the metaphor beyond its boundaries and leading one into blind alleys. At bottom, it is misinterpretation of the same metaphor that sometimes places God too pictorially in the world and sometimes places the world too pictorially in God. Upright love for truth shows that we have just entangled ourselves in words. Sacrifice words and, friend of truth, embrace your brother. <laughs> An ironic ending to the imagined dialogue. Similarly, Schleiermacher says, for since in the province of philosophy too, there is no universally valid formula that has been established for describing the relation between God and world, it is so much the more natural that in the realm of theological dogmatics, there sometimes occur formulas that come closer to the extreme of intermingled identity and sometimes formula that come, formulas that come closer to the extreme of oppositional separation. What I have just quoted from Mendelssohn and Schleiermacher seems to me the voice of wisdom in this matter. The imagery of inside and outside, sometimes clothed in the ostensibly metaphysical terminology of imminence and transcendence, may create an appearance of more disagreement than would remain in a clearer and more rigorous formulation. I have already mentioned all but the fifth of the following doctrines of some or all forms of traditional philosophical theism. They're also listed on the handout. First, creation and conservation, doctrine that uh, God, doctrine that God caused and, cause, and causes the world to exist. The world could not have begun to exist and could not continue to exist if God did not exist and cause its existence. Hence, necessarily, and the point is, in each of these there's a necessarily uh, operator on some proposition. Hence, necessarily, if the world exists, God exists and causes the world to exist. Second doctrine, concurrence. Necessarily, if and only if a creature acts and produces a, an effect, God acts in that act of the creature and shares in producing that effect. The creature could not otherwise do anything. Third, omniscience. Necessarily, if and only if something is true of the world, God knows that it is true of the world. And there are other parts of the doctrine of omniscience, but that's uh, an obviously relevant part of it. Fourth, omnisubjectivity. Necessarily, if any creature is in a conscious state, there is in God's knowing a perfect representation that includes everything that is internal to that conscious state, though it is connected with infinitely more additional knowledge in God's knowing than in the creature's knowing. Now, this is uh, the one of the five, I think, that it may be that most traditional theists would not include uh, as a doctrine of theism. Uh, but I, I have to say that I really think that uh, a relevantly complete omniscience uh, for the creator requires it to be included. Uh, fifth, omnipresence. Necessarily, if there is a space in which finite beings do or could exist, God is present everywhere in that space, not in the way that material objects fill or occupy a place, uh, but uh, God knows in the sense that God knows everything that occurs at every point in space and can act causally at every point in space without needing the intermediation of any created mechanism. Whatever else may be said about the relation between God and the world in traditional theism, these doctrines present a view according to which it is clearly appropriate to say that God and the world together 
constitute a single, tightly interconnected system in which God is intimately involved in the existence of the world and in everything that goes on in it. In traditional theism, of course, God is less tightly bound to the world than the world is to God, inasmuch as God could have existed without the world. Uh, indeed, uh, God originally did exist without it, if God is essentially in time, although many traditional theists deny that that, that is true of God, that they deny that God's in time. Theists then might say that God is the necessary part of the whole system and the world is the contingent part of it. Uh, Charles Hartshorn, uh, in some ways, uh, theist or pantheist, or panentheist, whatever he is, uh, does sort of say that. But that could be misleading, and uh, that wouldn't be the only thing that, actually, uh, uh, no, that isn't what Hartshorn's way of talking, but you, you, if you read him, he lays things out. It's very easy to change the terminology and say God's the necessary part of the system, the world is con the contingent part of it. That could be misleading, however. Medieval philosophical theologians did main maintain that in God there is nothing at all that is contingent. But it is hard, I think, indeed impossible, to see how all contingency can be kept outside of God if God contingently creates the world and God has perfect knowledge of contingent facts. Even granting that, however, even granting that there are contingent facts about God and thus contingency in God, uh, God remains, for traditional theists, the part of the whole system of reality that exists necessarily, and the world is the part that exists contingently. Pantheists have commonly denied that God could exist without any world at all. But many pantheists or panentheists, such as Charles Hartshorn, have maintained that God could have existed without any one or two or several, any of the particular finite things that actually exist. And even according to Spinoza, finite things can rightly be called contingent in the sense that none of them exists by the necessity of its own limited nature, but it is only by the necessity of the infinite divine nature that any of them exists. Pantheists, of course, will resist the suggestion that God is part of the whole system of reality. They prefer to say that the system as a whole is God. Do theists have good reason to refuse to identify the whole system of reality with God? Uh, or to say that we fi uh, finite be uh, refuse to say that we finite beings are parts of God? Certainly they in general have not said that. But does it matter? One way in which it might be thought to matter is that it is often important in theistic religious contexts to distinguish our wills from God's will and to admit that our wills may be contrary to God's will. But it is not obvious that a part of a whole cannot have a will that is contrary to the will of the whole. I am part of a political society, the United States of America, that has, for example, a policy of imposing the death penalty for certain crimes in certain circumstances. But that is not a policy of mine, and in fact, I do not approve of it. My will is opposed to it. That does not necessarily imply that I have no responsibility for it as a citizen of the USA, but that's another story for another occasion. It may not be worth arguing about whether we are parts of God as long as parts is not understood as meaning essential parts without which God could not exist. What I think it would certainly be wiser to avoid is arguing about whether God is outside the world, a question which may be even more misleading if dressed up in the pretentious more, more pretentious terminology of imminence and transcendence, which has been popular in religious discussions since the 19th century. Certainly, theists believe that God transcends finite, be finite things in the sense of being much more than they are and much more perfect. And some or most pantheists uh, might well find a sense in which they could agree with that. But do traditional theists believe that God is outside the world of finite beings? Certainly not if that means that God is not inside that world. Individually and collectively, the five theistic doctrines that I listed, some at least of which would be accepted by uh, 
at least an awful lot of traditional philosophical theists, uh, those doctrines uh, imply that God is constantly and intimately present in the world in unmediated knowledge and action in the sense indicated by the doctrine of divine omnipresence. I do not know, maybe someone can uh, supply my lack of memory on this point, but I do not know of any passage of the Christian canon of scripture in which it is implied that God is outside of the whole world of finite creatures. There are passages, of course, in which it is implied that God is at least sometimes in a heaven or sky above what we know as the planet Earth, a heaven in which creatures can be, and some creatures, angels at least, are. But that is not the same as being outside the whole world of finite creatures. And there are many biblical passages in which it is implied that God is present in the world of finite things. For instance, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, Psalm 145. And St. Paul is quoted in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts as quoting with approval a Greek text that he interprets as saying of God that in him, we, in him, we live and move and have our being. That is significantly, I think, the biblical text most often quoted in the works of George Barclay, philosopher and bishop. I quote finally a stunning, though perhaps not utterly obvious, implication of divine imminence and divine concurrence in St. Paul's letter to Christians in Rome, the eighth chapter of it, where he says the spirit, by which is meant undoubtedly the spirit of God, helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the spirit itself intercedes with wordless groans or with sighs too deep for words, as a more familiar but misleadingly wimpy translation has it. What are those groans? Does Paul suppose that the Spirit of God is at loss for words? Surely not. The groans, I think, must be those with which Paul has just said that Christians join the whole creation in groaning while waiting for eventual redemption. The human groans of the Roman Christians are implicitly identified with the divine Spirit's groaning. It seems it would be hard for God to be more imminent than that, but perhaps an incarnation would be even more imminent. <laughs> All right, so Dr. Adams, I, I was thinking that there, there was a passage which seems to substantiate the thesis that God is distinct from all finite reality. And I think that within Western theistic traditions, there's a, a doctrine uh, in systematic theology for all of these Western theistic traditions, which at least in part appeals to this passage to substantiate the doctrine itself. So uh, the passage is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And heavens and the earth, Hashemayim uh, ve'et ha'eretz, is a merism, right? Which is intended to refer to everything, everything besides God. And at least within the Christian tradition, right, uh, if you look to some of the creeds, this is interpreted as suggesting that God is the creator of all things, both visible and invisible. So if you wanted to say that they were abstract, oh, which were in some sense not uh, finite and yet you know, weren't created. So, so uh, I mean, there are other passages I could point to. Paul's own interpretation of this passage seems to suggest that the reading I'm going for. So I'm just wondering whether or not your understanding of things is consistent with the uh, Christian doctrine of creatio ex nihilo. First of all, let me make clear that uh, I did not mean to be exactly endorsing uh, a, a, a pantheist view or adopting the pantheist way of characterizing the relation between God and the world. Uh, what I have been trying to do is to explore uh, what the issues may be, what the relevant concisions are, and what are some ways of responding. Uh, what I did end up arguing for uh, is, uh, what, what, what should one say? I mean, uh, uh, as both Mendelssohn and Schleiermacher in somewhat different ways, counseled, not getting bent out of shape by this particular uh, disagreement unless uh, some, uh, you know, uh, 
certain doctrine, uh, certain affirmations and denials come in that don't seem to be part of all pantheist positions that might be called pantheists. Now, in the case of uh, God created the heavens and the earth, or God created everything that, that exists, that is one of uh, the standard theistic doctrines that I listed at the end. And uh, basically what I ha have to say about that and, and took myself to be, be suggesting, in fact, is that uh, a relationship like that uh, might uh, imply that uh, God is distinct from, uh, let's say, the earth, just to be simple and concrete, uh, at least in the sense that it's not true that God is identical with the earth. But, as I pointed out, holes typically are distinct from their parts in that sense. Uh, the, uh, you know, if, if you... Uh, 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 you know, this uh, podium or whatever, lectern, a uh, little reading desk attachment, uh, is distinct from its top in the sense that it's not identical with the top because there are other parts of it too. Uh, and, and so uh, the relation distinct from is not as strong. You're not saying as much when you say that the world is distinct from God as uh, when you say that, you know, the world is not in God and God is not in the world, that there's disjoint somehow. Uh, and in particular, for example, if we're talking about God's knowledge of our conscious states, uh, if you say, no, it can't be that uh, one and the same conscious state is my finite conscious state and a part of God's larger knowledge. Um, and um, there are various reasons why one might you know, go back and forth about that. One I didn't talk about at all is whether someone might uh, want to say that God has an immediate knowledge of our conscious states, among other things, and whether that wouldn't imply that somehow uh, my conscious state got into God's knowledge. Uh, um, so uh, that's what I was saying, and I, I was sort of arguing as I took both Mendelssohn and Schleiermacher to be arguing that one shouldn't be, uh, theists should not be scared of entertaining the possibility of particular consequences like that. Just real fast, you, you would though admit that w at least within the sort of like history of exegesis, the passage I, I, I cited, the Genesis 1-1 passage, is standardly interpreted as suggesting that there's sort of like a, a transcendence to, to, to what, God. From, what, would, what would you take transcendence to mean? Right, right. So I don't mean in the sense that you're suggesting that the finite cosmos is sort of like a part or a proper part of God, but, but I mean, this is a his, his history question about what you take the history of exegesis well, to be recommending uh, uh, in, the, in, in the Christian, Islamic, and Jewish tradition. Uh, I think my suggestion was that I am skeptical of uh, that uh, that I don't think that uh, every time someone in a religious context talks about the transcendence of God, that person is saying something that a philosopher could take into account very precisely in reasoning about God because uh, in, in the sort of terminology that Mendelssohn uses, uh, that's pictorial. I mean, you say God is, God is higher, it's up there, uh, it's outside and so forth. But if I, if I look at the way that the Bible talks about God, when it does talk about God being uh, somewhere, it's, it's virtually always in some place uh, uh, that can be located uh, in the created uh, cosmos. Now, I don't take that, as impl that either as implying that uh, speculation about God's being in some sense outside uh, the created cosmos uh, is ruled out. It's just that 
Uh, I mean, uh, transcendent is not a biblical word any more than imminent is. Hi, uh, so I wanted to ask about the relationship between omniscience and, inter and omnisubjectivity. So in the face of it, it seems that omniscience just implies omnisubjectivity because after all, um, you know, I, the fact it's true about the world that I am in this conscious mental state that I am at the moment. And so given the way you define omnis omniscience, that means uh, omnisubjectivity would be. So given that you just divide the two into two um, different theses, I suspect that there are going to be ways to understand conscious mental states such that there's the, the two don't collapse in the way I was I, suggesting I they do. I don't, I'm not sure that it turns on ideas about conscious mental states. Uh, to some extent, I, I'll confess, I mean, this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is very much work in progress for me, and I did not have time to research for myself uh, the, uh, as thoroughly as I would like uh, the question uh, just how uh, unpopular, as it were, uh, anything like uh, omnisubjectivity uh, was in traditional philosophical theology. I was taking Anthony Kenny's word for it. I mean, uh, he says uh, very flatly in uh, the third chapter of his book, The God of the Philosophers, that that was the way that traditional philosophical theology worked. He quotes Went. He quotes St. Thomas Aquinas. I'm more confident that he's right about St. Thomas Aquinas than about just how many people agreed with Thomas. However, uh, part of what's going on there, if we're talking about uh, St. Thomas Aquinas' uh, uh, conception of God's knowledge, uh, is that uh, Aquinas wants to say, and this is motivated by the fact that Aquinas does not want to allow that there is anything contingent about God, except God's being related in certain ways to contingent things, but they don't, they're not real relations in God. So that the idea is that, that God makes contingent choices without anything contingent going on in God, and that God knows contingent things without anything contingent going on in God. I don't see how that's uh, uh, coherent. Uh, I just don't believe it. I've never believed it. Uh, but it's clear that Aquinas said that. And so Aquinas wants to say that the way in which God knows our conscious states and indeed everything else about us is by causing us. And God knows what God is causing. God knows what God is doing. That's the idea. And, uh, and thereby, and by that, and not by having, as it were, any mental replica of our conscious states, God knows exactly what our conscious states are. Now, I confess I have never been un unable to see how a causal relationship like that would c confer the relevant sort of knowledge. However, Aquinas is not alone in this. Uh, in, uh, in Brian Leftow's recent book, uh, God and Necessity, uh, he suggests a theory of uh, divine cognition in which God, God's concepts uh, are basically all concepts of what God can cause. God's concepts of creatures, basically all concepts of what God can cause. And he agrees that, uh, God, yes, God should know what it's like uh, for a human being or a kitten to be in pain, uh, or a dog, I think was his, his example, and suggests, well, maybe God needs to have uh, some sam mental sample of uh, pain or something like that, uh, or, and, and, and he fudges away from it. I mean, uh, he, wants, he wants to leave the alternative open uh, of uh, it only being powers uh, to cause things that uh, provide the material, the stuff of, of God's knowing. I, don't, I, I find all such views uh, implausible and unsatisfying as accounts of knowledge, but in each case, I can see uh, how there are systematic motivations that lead to those views. I guess part of the question was, um, so that was very helpful, but part of the question was, how, what notion of conscious mental states would you have to have in order to accept omniscience without, in virtue of accepting omniscience, accepting omnisubjectivity? Well, uh, 
I'm not, I'm not going to answer that question because uh, I, uh, I don't think that a satisfying conception of divine omnipotence without omnisubjectivity is possible. Uh, I, I was cautious in the way that I was because uh, I'm trying not just to let out, lay out my own views, but to talk about uh, you know, discussions that have gone on and uh, you know, views that are on the table, what I think they imply and so forth. So I thought, well, I should you know, make clear that I'm not claiming that that is an integral part of the doctrine of divine omniscience for all or most of the theological, uh, of the philosophical theologians who have held the doctrine of divine omniscience. It probably isn't. I think it should be, but that, you know, I, I'm not going to rewrite the history on that account. Yes, I was, um, <coughs> thank you very much, extremely interesting. I was trying to think uh, what anticipations there might be of this debate in the 18th century. Uh, going way back mm -hmm. uh, to the ancient period, so I would be interested. Yeah, if and so uh, to think of uh, where anything that goes in the direction of pantheism might be found there. Of course, we have already in Thales the view that everything is full of gods. Mm -hmm. Now that sounds at first at least more like pan polytheism mm -hmm. uh, than it does like pantheism, though it may have been connected in uh, with this uh, view of Thales that everything is a form of water mm -hmm. and that water has a certain kind of divinity mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, to it, uh, eternality, uh, maybe even life of, uh, of a certain sort and, and, and so on. But, but the more interesting, uh, I mean, the reactions to that are all very naturalistic. So that, that's mm -hmm. not, that not, uh, tie, t uh, doesn't tie up with this debate. But there is an interesting connection which does tie up and may have some bearing on this issue about Aquinas that uh, you and Susanna were talking about. And, and that's the difference uh, between uh, um, uh, the role of, of God, now uh, a single, uh, in, in the Timaeus of Plato mm -hmm. and then in Aristotle's uh, metaphysics uh, and, 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 and physics. Um, you, you, have to, you have to go with a certain tradition here to make this work. But all right, so Plato has a world soul. Uh, so there is uh, a mm -hmm. single being that has all sorts of uh, divine right. attributes, the world, mm -hmm. which is alive and ensouled and uh, so on. Right. So that sounds very pantheistic, mm -hmm. uh, can be pushed in that direction. Of course, there's the demiurge too, but in a certain tradition of interpretation, uh, the demiurge is non-literal. Uh, so the real literal story is this eternal uh, uh, world which is ensouled and so on. Now, the, the question is, all right, how is that opposed then? All right, so that's something in the pantheistic uh, direction fairly strongly, uh, but how is that opposed in Aristotle and why is it opposed? Well, it's opposed in, in Aristotle, obviously, because his divinity, his prime divinity, the prime, prime mover, is no world soul at all, but exercises its causal influence in a very different sort, a very complex uh, sort of way. But, but why? Why would Aristotle, uh, so how might he figure in on, uh, in some debate about this? Well, it really, a lot of it, uh, there are many aspects of it, but the one that ties in with some of the discussion that we had uh, it has to do with the perfection of God, with the idea of the perfection of God. Uh, and uh, so that and this this world is in many ways imperfect. I mean, the problem of evil comes up, uh, contingency comes up, but uh, and uh, and so that even gets Aristotle pushed to saying, and he has many reasons for this, but at a more ordinary level, say in his ethics, where he's uh, operating not so much from the scientific point of view, uh, it's him pushed into saying, well, how could God this God, be concerned with such things as my pain and, and such things as that. And that's how it might tie in with the Aquinas or I mean, feel my pain? I mean, why is that something, a divine being, that could concern a divine being? So the divine being is pushed in the direction, as you know, of having a very restricted form of life uh, concerned with a high-powered intellectual activity out of this push for perfection. 
so and I think that does tie in with this thing about powers and so on that you were that you were introducing so there is that strong thing in the tradition and one might even suggest well there's a certain tension in the Judeo-Christian conception there because you want this perfection uh, in God and so you want some kind of distance between God and the uh, uh, a contingent or created or, or even eternal but distinct world uh, 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 due to that factor. Yeah. Uh, thank you. That's very interesting. And I think that, I mean, certainly some resistance to aspects of the idea of omnisubjectivity uh, which can be found in some, oh, some correspondence at uh, Leibniz uh, with a contemporary at a relatively early stage in his career um, about you know how could God uh, uh, feel pain and uh, this uh, was being posed not so much as a uh, challenge to the doctrine of um, divine omniscience as to uh, Leibniz's conception of God as uh, uh, what Kant called an Ains Realism, and basically a being whose properties are the archetypes of right. all positive properties that creatures can have in, of course, diminished forms. But pain seems to be a positive property uh, in some way, and so uh, mustn't God have it? And Leibniz wrestles uh, with this. Mustn't God have an archetype of it? Uh, I think that uh, I think, frankly, that the uh, uh, the five doctrines, and you wouldn't have to have all of them in it. Uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, omniscience, uh, creation, conservation, and concurrence are enough. Uh, rules out any clean hands. Uh, conception of divine perfection. And uh, I personally think it should be ruled out. I, I think that, uh, that one of my general views about the role of the concept of perfection in the history of theology or thought about God or gods, or indeed moral thought uh, generally, but especially about uh, gods or perfect beings, uh, is that it has tended to be conceived far too negatively. Um, and of course the universal quantifier is, is a negative, as we know, among other things. And um, the, uh, um, you know, if, to the extent that we think there is dirt in the created world, God has dirty hands. Uh, God, I mean, I, I think it's 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 not possible. Uh, you know, theodicy is not going to work. Not not if one really thinks that God is infinite and omnipotent, omniscient, and so forth. It's not going to work by saying uh, that God isn't responsible for the the bad things or whatever. Uh, and uh, Schleiermacher again, one of my favorite theologians is, I think, of the uh, main figure, mainstream figures in the history of, of Christian theology, the one who actually sees, ha, saw that most clearly and said, yeah, you know, God's the author of these things, including sin. I mean, the, it, it, you know, it's all in the picture. God's re responsible for the whole thing. And um, he also uh, will not, I mean, it's very important to him uh, that uh, blessedness is a characteristic. Well, actually, uh, for him, he, he doesn't think he knows that sort of thing about the divine nature, but uh, about the characteristic, a characteristic of Jesus, but it's not incompatible with pain, and that depends on his adopting a sort of stoic conception of, of blessedness. Um, so... Uh, yeah, uh, all of those things are in there. But I, I think, I do understand the pressure there. Right. 
Yeah, I wanted to address the um, the challenge issued by Mendelssohn on page one of your handout about finding predicates that apply that apply to uh, this predicates that apply to the images in God, and not the archetypes, or vice versa, to distinguish them. But I also wanted to. It seems to me that Mendelssohn and Lessing are running two things together that need to be distinguished. One one is the question of whether um, things in the world are, in some sense, in God, parts of God, or whatever. And a second, and that, that's one question. And a different question is, in what sense are, am I distinct from the image God has of me? Because even if I am, I could still be a part of God, right? I mean... That's also true. Yes. Right, yeah. So those questions, they seem to run together, those questions. Well, but, but let me, well, well, let me just address this different predicates thing. I mean, it seems to me here's an obvious thing to say, that... Uh, so God created the universe, you know, and so there was a time prior to the universe being created, and it's, it seems to me you'd want to say that God had these images then, and then what he did was actualize them, <laughs> and so here's a predicate that applies to me and not to my image in God. I'm the actualization of that image. Um, seems like a really natural thing to say. Yes, okay, thank you. Those are good questions. I'm afraid... The answers that uh, that I can that I, I need to give first, and it's what what there's time for, uh, to, you know, to connect appropriately with what I said before and what I was doing uh, with the history, uh, are not going to satisfy you very well. Uh, the uh, I mean, as to the first, yes. Uh, I, but I, I don't think that either uh, uh, Lessing uh, or Mendelssohn was supposing that a replication of my, con uh, you know, my conscious state being in God would be the, you know, that that was the only possible focus or form that my being a part of God could be thought to take. So uh, it's, it's rather that... Uh, they were asking as a particular case, would this be something that uh, that seems to be, you know, sort of quintessentially uh, me, or at least something central to my being me, that would have to be in God. That's, that's the way uh, their discussion goes. But the other thing is that I think it's very clear that the question that was posed in, in these texts of Mendelssohn, if one looks at the way it comes up in the earlier text of Lessing, uh, it's quite clear that it was in Lessing was in part asking, okay, and I think Mendelssohn was too, uh, okay, suppose that as Leibniz thinks and says, God has these conceptions of all uh, these possible worlds and God picks one of them and makes it actual. What is it that God adds to that conception to make it actual or, or does to that conception to make it actual? So, uh, the, uh, and, uh, so Lessing isn't going to let you just say, okay, that answers the question. Lessing is going to say, yeah, that's what I'm wondering about. What, you, you talk about actuality here. What is it you know, that makes it actual? And... Um, Fair enough, but the predicate still applies to the one thing and not the other, and now we have to figure out what the predicate yes. means. But yes, but uh, I mean that very thing may be one of the things that prompted Schleiermacher uh, to agree on this point with Spinoza and say uh, uh, that God's actual creation, God's power, is fully realized in the actual creation. There are no other possible creations. Uh, now that that's that is a rather heterodox and atypical. Christian theological statement, but uh, it does, you know, it's one way of sol answering well, your question. Just, just, just real quick, I, I don't think that does address the question. He, he, even, yeah. even if there's only one way things could have been, it was unactualized at some point. And so there's still a difference uh, between the image in God and the actualization. But well, I know there are other people. I lost control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Actually, I want to, I, I feel I should mention one more thing. In answer to that question, there is an answer that uh, uh, that I think uh, really needs to be on the table when when that uh, question is being discussed, which is that the difference between what that basically God doesn't in fact uh, 
imagine complete possible worlds. Uh, God has knowledge only of all, uh, discursive knowledge of all general possibilities and uh, sort of perhaps experientially image-based knowledge of certain properties. Uh, but God doesn't think non-actual possible worlds in complete detail. And so the difference between the actual and the, poss- uh, and the merely possible is that the actual is completely determinate. Uh, that was Charles Hartshorn's view, for example. So I was trying to think about uh, what Spinoza said about monism, what genuine offense it could have given uh, his, the religious authorities who objected to it, given, given what you've said about uh, uh, pantheism in your talk. So I, I guess um, one, is, it was important to Spinoza that as modes of God, and so conceived through God, we could have uh, uh, knowledge of the infinite and eternal essence of God. In fact, it was easy to have since extension is, is, is one, of his, uh, one way of conceiving of his essence. Um, and so, and, and that does seem to connect up to some traditional ideas about pantheism. So then by studying the natural world through our natural cognitive capacities, we can come to have uh, knowledge of God. Um, it seems, uh, so most traditional theologians would like to deny that. That seems connected to uh, uh, concerns about transcendence and so on. And you can believe that that's impossible while still holding all uh, five of the, the doctrines. So um, that... Uh, so it seems like uh, maybe that's a, a way of distinguishing the, the pantheist from the traditional theologian. Well, uh, first of all, uh, it's probable that many of the people who felt outraged by Spinoza's ethics didn't understand it correctly. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that, uh, um, you know, even Moses Mendelssohn, who had certainly had good will towards Spinoza, and wanted to understand him fairly, uh, misread him as uh, uh, thinking that uh, uh, that God is merely just a sum total of finite things. Uh, and well, you know, Spinoza is a very difficult author. I mean, in teaching early modern philosophy, I actually found that my undergraduate students uh, ended up understanding Spinoza less well than they ended up understanding Kant. And, uh, uh, the, uh, well, had they he's a very diffi- point, he's a very difficult. They author. would have had a legitimate uh, complaint. He's a very difficult author. But uh, what's also true is uh, that there are certain things that Spinoza does deny. Uh, the most important of them probably is that there is any divine uh, uh, will or purposiveness, purposiveness uh, uh, on the whole. I mean, we have, purp- we, we have purposes, we have canatus or strivings, that's a characteristic of finite uh, modes of God, but not of God. And th- it goes with that that God, Spinoza's God is beyond good and evil. There, so. There's no place in Spinoza's system for the thought that the world is one way rather than another because this is the best way for it to be. And that's something that Leibniz accurately perceived in Spinoza, and that was uh, Leibniz's, I mean, when Leibniz was being honest, I think usually when he said something negative about Spinoza, he really believed what he was saying. When he agreed with him, he kept that to himself. But uh, the... uh, um, uh, the Leibniz's, I think, most central complaint to Spinoza was what he called Spinoza's blind <laughs> determinism. Now, Leibniz himself was a sort of determinist, but uh, uh, when he talked about Spinoza's blind determinism, I think what he really meant was that in Spinoza's system, there's no room for something being the case because it's good. Uh, and... Um, you know that's a that's a difference with Spinoza that that goes very deep in the history of early modern uh, philosophy, not least in the philosophy of Kant. And 
and and that so that's certainly part of it. Well, sure, but I mean, um, that's sort of orthogonal to his pantheism. Um, of course, the, of the, course. The, I was thinking the way that pantheism. Sorry, Dean, I know. <laughs> pantheism does show up as a, as a as a point of conflict. Is this idea that you could know God through uh, natural cognitive capacities? Uh, I don't think that the idea of knowing God through natural cognitive capacities was taboo. Natural theology. It was natural theology, yes. Knowing the essence of God. Well, I don't think that I don't think that. Uh, excited horror anyway. You know, I mean, uh, Aquinas thought that we couldn't know the essence of God until we got the be beatific vision, if we were so uh, blessed as to get it. But I, I don't think that uh, violating that restriction would have occasioned anything like the horror that people felt uh, about uh, Spinoza's uh, uh, philosophy and theology. I, and furthermore, I don't want to uh, set up some explanation that shows that that horror was wholly rational. I don't believe it was. Um, so uh, this is very nice and uh, reminds me of good old days when I regularly learned from you interesting things about things that I know very little about. So um, I have a couple of questions and I, I hope it doesn't um, go completely wrong is uh, about omnisubjectivity and it, it seems to me that um, that if if you understand God's knowledge of um, our conscious states in this way in uh, that there are um, quasi like introspective states in God's mind uh, of our all our conscious states so if that's the model that I, I think that that gives gives you a reason to think that um, there is, after all, a distinction between our minds and God's mind. Because in our minds, there are all sorts of conscious states even that are not introspected, right? So if all there was is God's introspection of our conscious states, then how would you, what, what uh, could make it the case that some of our conscious states are introspected and some are not? Can you give me an example of a pair uh, one of them uh, of conscious states that one might have, we might have, one of them introspective and one not. I'm not sure. I I, I, I rarely I, introspect my conscious states. I don't know if you if you do all the time, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, uh, well, I suppose. I would, I would probably uh, th think of it this way, that uh, <coughs> I don't know whether this is the distinction you have in mind. Uh, 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 you know, if I'm, say, I'm engaging in discussion with uh, you all, and I'm looking around and I'm seeing you in the room and I'm he hearing uh, what you say, and I also am seeing the lights on and the, the color of the walls and uh, the uh, uh, poster and, and, and so forth and uh, what you're wearing and uh, the lectern in front of me. I, I'm seeing all of those things. And, uh, uh, but I'm not paying attention to all of them. Uh, and many of the ones that I'm not paying attention to uh, I couldn't tell you two seconds later whether I'd seen them or not. That's true. Uh, on the other hand, some of them that I wasn't paying attention to at the time, I could tell you probably whether I'd seen them or not. Okay. There we are. Now, is the, the introspected ones are the ones I'm paying attention to? Uh, well, the introspective ones, you, you're paying attention to, but, but more than that, you uh, uh, form an... Uh, form an idea to the effect that you are having them, right? Isn't that in introspection? Uh -huh. So when we talk about God's okay. knowledge, it's some sort of conceptualization, perhaps not an independent conception, but conceptualization of the experience or thought or whatever you're having. And since we are not having those all the time, um, it cannot be that all that happens is God's knowledge of uh, our conscious states. <laughs> 
uh -huh. um, because they, then then I don't see how we could, you know, what could make it the case that some of our thoughts are introspective uh, and some of them okay. are not. The place of discursive knowledge, conceptualized knowledge in God's knowledge, uh, is historically quite controversial. In Kant's conception of God, there was no such thing, mm -hmm. uh, for example. Um, the, uh, so one might think that God simply has perfect intuitive knowledge. Uh, non, you know, not, he's not classifying it or thinking how one would describe it conceptually. God doesn't need to do that. Uh, God has intuitive knowledge of my, my present conscious state, including what I'm seeing but not really registering because I'm concentrating on talking with you. Uh, and in that sense, God, God would know that conscious state better than I do. Um, now, would it, would, in that case, would the, uh, you know, the, the image or representation or whatever it is in God's consciousness have to be qualitatively different from what's in my consciousness simply by the fact that uh, it is more distinct to God, that God does see more about it? That's an interesting question, and uh, that, uh, um, uh, that might be a line of argument that uh, an opponent of the omnisubjectivity argument for uh, the containment of our conscious states in God uh, could make something of. That's an interesting thought. I was curious about as to why in your discussion of the 18th and 19th century debates in Germany about um, pantheism, you didn't include the philosophies of absolute spirit advocated by Schelling and Hegel because you could, I would venture to say, interpret the latter as intentional projects that try to solve all those problems that you have pointed to uh, in your talk, such as how to reconcile the idea that individual agents must be separate from God as autonomous subjects and still God, to posit God as an all-encompassing entity, since uh, the, those philosophies of absolute spirit, of course, conceive of absolute spirit as, as such a substance that is also a subject and thus relates to itself by emanating all of world history that comes to uh, a conscious realization that it is just an emanation of God in the course of which God cognizes himself. So that seems to be, I don't know, one step further uh, from, from Schleiermacher and, and all his, his fellows, and probably more systematic as well. Uh, well, actually, within his theological work, Schleiermacher is pretty systematic. But, uh, uh, but actually, what you suggest is something that would be good to have done. Frankly, I don't know enough about Schelling and Hegel to do it. Um, I had a question about om omnisubjectivity, because mm -hmm. um, you're keen on that right, as, as, as an essential part yeah, of an account it, it of It looks uh, to me like something that should be part of divine omniscience. Um, I just wondered if you, if you had anything, any sort of particular way of dealing with, um, um, uh, there's, uh, not phenomenal, but, the, but in, intentionality, um, the intentionality of subjectivity uh, in connection with sort of I, I thoughts and Day, what, what now get called day say attributions because um, you know presumably to, to, if, if God knows what we know in terms of, of what we know sort of as it were from from the inside he, he at least has to at the very least has to be able to sort of entertain the thoughts that we're having even if he knows they're false you know but it looks as though there's this kind of logical difficulty there that, you know if, if I does refer then there seems to be a well I mean Frege has good arguments uh, about, about it having a, a mode of presentation that, that is logically restricted to me and that might be a, a weird logical byproduct of, of the existence of finite consciousness but it still looks like a very difficult problem uh, if you if you're going to say that omni, omni subjectivity is really vital to, well, to omniscience. That's one where, let me make two comments about it. Uh, first is uh, that um, 
it, this might be easier for someone whose account of God's knowledge uh, represents it as uh, totally intuitive and not uh, conceptual. I mean, and sort of in a... Uh, Not discursive. So, uh, what, and that person might say, "Look, saying saying I, you know, that that's conceptual, and this is uh, something. It has to do with how we behave in in relation to to uh, what we know, and that doesn't have to be in God. But on the other hand, the uh, you know the the partisan of omnisubjectivity might have an easier time of it here. Uh, well, no, the, the, the pantheist, a somewhat pantheist or panentheist uh, theologian might have an easier time of omnisubjectivity here uh, because uh, if one is prepared to say that yes, uh, my conscious state is uh, a, a uh, an aspect, a state in 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 the history of something that is going on in God, as a part of God's life. Uh, then, uh, when I say I, it refers to that part of God's life, but that's not the same as referring to the whole of God's life, or the the the. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be, as it were. The saying I doesn't have to be said from the perspective of the completely integrated divine consciousness, but only uh, in the part in which on this account it would be being said self-referentially. <laughs>